Belize has long been the exception in Central America. Its official language is English when all its neighbors speak Spanish. It has not suffered the civil wars that rocked the region and it has opted for a parliamentary form of government joining only a handful of others in the continent. To find out how this happened, join me for a brief explainer on Belizean history and politics. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the region was dominated by the Maya. But by the time the Spanish showed up in the 16th century, their civilization was in decline as a combination of massive droughts and internal squabbles took their toll. This was only exacerbated by the germs that Europeans brought, which promptly wiped out a significant part of the population. Nonetheless, it still took decades for the Spanish to take control of what is now Belize. In the 1540s, a conquistador force based in the Yucatan set out on an expedition through much of present-day Belize, down the coast and across to the Central Highlands. Disappointed by the lack of riches uncovered, they left a bloody trail of slaughtered victims and abandoned villages in their wake. In the early 1600s, the Maya finally staged a counteroffensive that successfully drove out the few Spanish settlers and missionaries that had decided to stay. Weakened and fearful, the Maya did not return to the now desolate old cities, choosing instead to stay huddled in the remote interior, far from other main outposts of their empire. Spanish claims on Belize would be tenuous at best and would soon be challenged, not just by indigenous people, but also by other Europeans. As the Spanish became a transatlantic power by extracting gold from its colonies, the temptation to steal some of that loot became too great for other European powers. Spain's spoils were set upon by British buccaneers, French corsairs, and Dutch freebooters. In times of war, they were put into the service of their crown as privateers. At other times, they were simply pirates. Belize emerged as one of several Caribbean outposts for Britain's maritime marauders. In the early 17th century, English sea dogs first began using the Bay of Honduras as a staging point for raids on Spanish commerce. Henceforth, the Brits in the region came to be known as Baymen. The Belizean coast had several strategic advantages from a pirate's perspective. The land was both bountiful and uninhabited, as the Spanish had already driven the Maya out into the interior, but never bothered to settle in themselves. It was just a short sail away from the heavily trafficked Yucatan Straits where, if luck be with ye, the treasure fleet might be gathering in Havana or the silver train passing through on its way from Panama. And the shoreline, concealed behind thick mangroves and littoral islands, offered protective cover, while the long barrier reef was a treacherous underwater trap that kept Spanish galleons at a distance. The British first settled in Belize officially in 1638 when they settled at the mouth of the Belize River. It was then that a Scottish pirate captain, Peter Wallace, decided to organize the building of a new port town. Legend has it that he laid the first foundations of what became Belize City with wood chips and rum bottles, presumably empty. The town would become the capital of the colony for over 300 years, and the story goes that Wallace would also give the country its moniker, as supposedly the Spanish pronunciation of Wallace's name became the basis for the name Belize. Meanwhile, the Baymen found yet another activity to annoy the Spanish crown, poaching its rainforest. The settlement became a rich source of hardwoods, especially mahogany, much valued by carpenters, furniture makers, and shipbuilders back in Britain. In addition, the lowland forest was abundant in logwood trees, which provided a valuable dye extract used to make woolen textiles. By the 18th century, Britain's monarch finally had a navy and a merchant fleet to match Spain's. Privateers were no longer needed, and pirates were a nuisance. In 1765, Jamaican-based British naval commander Admiral Barnaby paid a visit to the rough-hewn Bayman and delivered a code of laws on proper imperial etiquette. Thieving, smuggling, and cursing were out. Paying taxes and obeying the sovereign were in. As the British settlement became more profitable, the Spanish monarch became more irritable. Spain's armed forces made several unsuccessful attempts to dislodge the well-ensconced and feisty squatters. With the Treaty of Paris in 1763, Spain instead tried diplomacy. 
negotiating a deal in which the Brits could stay and harvest wood as long as they paid rent to the Spanish crown and promised not to expand the settlement. The Baymen did neither. Spain finally got the better of the Baymen in 1779, burning down Belize City in a surprise attack and consigning the prisoners to slavery in Cuba. But it was still not enough to remove the British from Belize. The conclusion would not come until 1798 as a result of the Battle of St. George's Cay, when a squadron of 30 Spanish warships was met and turned back by the alerted baymen operating in smaller but faster craft. From this point, Spain gave up trying to boot the Brits from Belize, and the battle remained such a good story that it eventually inspired a national holiday, the Battle of St. George's Cay Day. As the economy was centered on timber exports, strong bodies were needed to perform the arduous labor of harvesting hardwoods from the dense rainforest. As elsewhere in the Americas, kidnapped Africans provided the muscle, along with much sweat and pain. By 1800, the settlement numbered about 4,000 in total, 3,000 black and slave people, 900 mixed race coloreds and free blacks, and 100 white colonists. Slave masters could count and acted shrewdly to stay on top. Enslaved males were kept divided into small work teams based on tribal origins. They were forced to do long tours of duty in remote jungle camps, separated from other teams and from their families. Enslaved women performed domestic chores and farm work. Interracial separation, however, did not mean interracial segregation, as mixed race Creoles the descendants of kidnapped Africans would eventually make up nearly 75% of the population. In 1838, slavery was abolished in the British Empire. The plight of Afro-Belizeans, however, did not much improve. They were forbidden from owning land, which would have enabled them to be self-sufficient and thus remain dependent on the white controlled export economy. Instead of slaves, they were called apprentices and worked for subsistence wages. At the same time that the settlement was grappling with the ramifications of the end of slavery, a new ethnic group, the Garifuna, appeared. In the early 19th century, the Garifuna, descendants of Caribs of the Lesser Antilles and of Africans who had escaped from slavery, arrived in settlement. The Garifuna had resisted the British and the French in the Lesser Antilles until they were defeated by the British in 1796. After putting down a violent Garifuna rebellion, on St. Vincent, the British moved between 1,700 and 5,000 of the Garifuna across the Caribbean to the Bay Islands, off the north coast of Honduras. From there, they migrated to the Caribbean coasts of Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, and the southern part of present-day Belize. By 1802, about 150 Garifuna had settled in the Stan Creek area and were engaged in fishing and farming. In 1872, the British imposed new rules under the Crown Lands Ordinance, which established Carib and Maya reserves and stripped the Garifuna and Maya of their property rights. Toward the mid-19th century, British colonists finally came into contact and conflict with the indigenous Maya. As loggers penetrated deep into the interior, they encouraged the elusive natives who responded with hit-and-run assaults on the encroaching axemen. At this time, in Mexico, in the neighboring Yucatan Peninsula, an armed conflict broke out among the lowly Maya, second-class mestizos, and privileged Spanish-descended landlords. The bloody War of the Costs raged for over a decade and forced families to flee. Cost war refugees more than doubled the police population, from less than 10,000 in 1845 to 25,000 in 1861. The movement of peoples redefined the ethnic character of northern Belize. Mestizo refugees of mixed Spanish and Indian stock brought their Hispanic tongue, corn tortillas, and Catholic churches to scattered small-town settlements. Yucatecan Maya refugees, meanwhile, moved into the northwestern Belizean rainforest, where they quickly clashed with the logging industry. In 1872, the desperate Maya launched a exotic attack on British colonists at Orange Walk, in what was a fierce but futile last stand. Diminished and dispirited, the remaining Maya survived on the territorial and social fringes of the colony. 
largely as a result of the costly military expeditions against the Maya, the expenses of administering the new colony, now officially called British Honduras, increased. At a time when the economy was severely depressed, great landowners and merchants dominated the legislative assembly, which controlled the colony's revenues and expenditures. Some of the landowners were also involved in commerce, but their interests differed from the other merchants of Belize Town. The former group resisted the taxation of land and favored an increase in import duties. The latter preferred the opposite. These conflicting interests produced a stalemate in the Legislative Assembly, which failed to authorize the raising of sufficient revenue. Unable to agree among themselves, the members of the Legislative Assembly surrendered their political privileges and asked for the establishment of direct British rule in return for the greatest security of crown colony status. The new constitution was inaugurated in April 1871 and the new legislature became the Legislative Council. Under the new constitution of 1871, British Honduras was officially governed by five ex officio or official and four appointed or unofficial members. Throughout the 19th century, the forestry industry's control of land and its influence in colonial decision-making slowed the development of agriculture and the diversification of the economy. Though British Honduras had vast areas of sparsely populated, unused land, land ownership was controlled by a small European monopoly. This concentration and centralization of capital meant that the direction of the colony's economy was henceforth determined largely in London. It also signaled the eclipse of the old settler elite. By about 1890, most commerce in British Honduras was in the hands of a clique of Scottish and German merchants, most of them newcomers. The European minority exercised great influence in the colony's politics, partly because it was guaranteed representation on the wholly appointed Legislative Council. In 1892, the governor appointed several Creole members but whites remained the majority. Thus, as the 19th century closed, the orderly ways of colonial life in British Honduras showed signs of breakdown. By 1900, the U.S. surpassed Britain as the main destination of the mahogany harvest. By 1930, the U.S. was taking in 80% of all Belizean exports. Declining timber fortunes caused colonial capitalists to impose a 50% weight cut on mahogany workers in Belize City, which provoked riotous protests and the first steerings of a social movement. During the first half of the 20th century, Belizean nationalism developed in explosive fits and starts. During World War I, a regiment of local Creoles was recruited for the Allied cause. The experience proved both disheartening and enlightening. Ill-treated because of their dark skin, they were not even allowed to go to the front line and fight alongside white troops. They may have enlisted as patriotic Brits, but they were discharged as resentful Belizeans. Upon their return in 1919, they coaxed several thousand into the street of Belize City in an angry demonstration against the existing order. In the 1930s, the economy was hit by the worldwide Great Depression and Belize City was largely destroyed by a hurricane in 1931. A series of strikes and demonstrations by laborers and the unemployed gave rise to a trade union movement and to demands for democratization. The movement fed on the daily discontents of impoverished black workers and spewed its wrath at prosperous white merchants. This forced the Legislative Assembly to reintroduce the right to vote in 1936, but property, literacy, and gender qualifications severely limited the franchise. When the governor used his reserve powers to devalue the currency at the end of 1949, leaders of the trade union and the Creole middle class formed a People's Committee to demand constitutional changes. This process led to the formation of a party advocating independence, the People's United Party, or PUP. When World War II caused the sudden closing of export markets, the colony experienced a severe economic crisis that lasted until well after the war's end. Anti-British demonstrations spread all across Belize, becoming more militant and occasionally violent. Colonial authorities declared a state of emergency, forbidding public meetings and intimidating independence advocates. In response, the PUP organized a successful general strike that finally forced Britain to make political concessions. 
universal suffrage was extended to all adults and limited home rule was permitted in the colony. The imperial foundations of the old ruling elite crumbled as the colony's ethnically divided peoples now danced to a common Belizean drumbeat. Nonetheless, full independence for Belize was put off until a nagging security matter was resolved. Spain never formally renounced its territorial claim to Belize, which was later appropriated by Mexico and Guatemala. In the 19th century, Britain signed agreements with both claimants to recognize the existing colonial borders, but the one with Guatemala and the Rafael Carrera did not stick. Part of the agreement had been the building of a road connecting Guatemala to the Caribbean coast. But since it was never built, Guatemala's view is that the treaty became null and void. This has been the position of the Guatemalan government since at least 1884. The 1945 Guatemalan constitution explicitly included Belize as part of its territorial reach. Britain, in turn, stationed a large number of troops in the West to protect it from a potential invasion that never came. By the 1960s, the border threat was stabilized and the demand for independence was renewed. Belizeans waited patiently. In 1964, the colony became fully self-governing, installing a Westminster-style parliamentary system. In 1971, the capital was relocated to Belmopan, after Hurricane Hattie caused major damage to Belize City. Nonetheless, despite the seat of government move, Belize City remains the most populated place in the country, while Belmopan is the smallest capital city in the Americas, with a population of only around 14,000 people. In 1973, the name was officially changed from the colonial-sounding British Honduras to the more popular Belize. And in September 1981, Belize was at last declared an independent nation-state within the British Commonwealth. Even Guatemala recognized Belize as a sovereign nation in 1991, although to this day it maintains its territorial claim. Independence did not turn out to be a cure-all. The angry nationalists that led Belize to independence turned into accommodating capitalists. The country had a small economy whose fortunes were determined beyond its control in global commodity markets. Belizeans eventually discovered that rather than remain vulnerable to exports, they had something valuable to import, tourists. The rise of ecotourism and revival of Maya culture has reshaped contemporary Belize and continues to do so. Its politics, meanwhile, have been dominated by two parties, the People's United Party, or PUP, and the United Democratic Party, or UDP, with each representing one of the sides of the political spectrum. The PUP, the one on the center left, was absolutely dominant prior to independence in 1981. Led by George Price, the man now credited as being one of the architects of Belizean independence, it won nearly every parliamentary election, consolidated political autonomy, and promoted a new middle class. In 1996, at the age of 75, Price finally stepped down with the status of a national hero. This left the PUP vulnerable, especially because in the next few years the party would be tainted by corruption scandals, missing pension funds, selling off of public lands, and bribery. The UDP and their leader, Dean Barrow, seized the opportunity. In 2008, he became the country's first black prime minister and ended up dominating the country's politics for the following 12 years. Constitutionally barred from running again, the UDP then turned into Barrow's Minister of National Security in February 2020, John Saldivar. What initially looked like a smooth campaign season for the ruling party, however, was quickly appended by Saldivar's implication in a U.S. federal trial in Utah, where a witness testified that the would-be prime minister was allegedly paid to provide a Belizean passport for one of the defendants in the trial. The explosive allegations basically ended Saldivar's political career and paved the way for a return of the PUP into power. The current Prime Minister, John Briseño, was elected in November 2020. Meanwhile, despite the growth in tourism, economic prosperity remains elusive for most Belizeans. A few entrepreneurs have made big money and a small middle class survives from business, tourism, and other professions. But many more Belizeans live on subsistence incomes in rudimentary circumstances. In 2013, an estimated 41% of the population lived below the poverty line. Likewise, unemployment has reached 14% in recent years, 
and labor, whether washing hotel sheets, cutting sugar cane, or packing bananas, is poorly paid when compared with the high cost of living. Although Belize has the second highest per capita income in Central America, this does not reflect the huge disparity that exists between the rich and the poor. Meanwhile, although tourism provided an out to what had been a fragile economy too dependent on commodities, it is not without cost. The most important is the environmental damage, especially those that cruise ships bring. In recent years, this has become an important matter of political debate as some people in the government believe that cruise ships do not contribute enough to the local economy to justify their impact on the environment and infrastructure. The other problem is that when one has a country where 40% of GDP is based on tourism, it is particularly vulnerable to global economic crises, and COVID-19 has hit the country hard. Thus, the current economic downturn is the worst on record in Belize's post-independence history. In the second quarter of 2020, GDP fell by 23% year on year. Exports declined by 37% in the same period. The IMF forecasts that Belize's economy will contract by 12% in 2020, one of Central America's worst growth rates. And so, despite a much different history to the rest of its neighbors, Belize's problems are not all that distinct. Whether it will be able to manage the economy downturn and overcome some of its entrenched poverty remains to be seen.